Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining once more the robotics seminar. Um, it's great to welcome today Frank Dallard. Um, thanks, Frank, for making time to come um, and sharing some of your insights and some of your experience. It's great to have you here. Um, Frank is professor at Georgia Tech's School of Interactive Computing and also a research scientist at Google AI. And uh, Frank's work, um, um, he works on frameworks for robust perception. And um, his work has been highly influential. Uh, some of you might be familiar with, uh, for example, GTSAM, um, a factor graph based um, estimation framework for sensor fusion. It's a library that has been widely distributed, widely used by uh, many people, many of us in this, in this room. Uh, to solve complex estimation problems like uh, SLAM or um, a structure for motion. And uh, Frank has also worked to transfer some of that technology to industry um, at Google and before that at Facebook, Reality Labs, and uh, maybe um, most influential, I would say, um, as a chief scientist at Skydio where uh, it's a company that sort of was founded by, it's a drone company founded by um, MIT people, MIT students, that I heard sometime this year that became a unicorn. So uh, I guess well done. Uh, yeah. I don't know if, um, um, are you, are you going to pay a round for everyone here later? There's free cookies. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Anyway, well done, really well done, very influential both academically and, uh, and in industry. So it's an honor to have you here, Frank. Thanks for coming. Um, we're all eager to hear more about factor graphs for perception and action. Thank you. All right. Thank you for having me. This is great. Um, yeah, I've been doing factor graphs for quite a while. Uh, and, and, and Luca actually worked with me to make a lot of that possible. In fact, I, I, I could probably not have done any of the work at Skydio without Luca, uh, you know, having visited my lab and, and done a lot of work. So, um, and of course, Michael Ka uh, Case, who was who was a postdoc in, in John's lab uh, for a while now, is at CMU for, for quite a while already. Um, so there is a deep MIT connection with all this work, and, and I'm very honored and pleased to see that many of you are in fact using GTSAM. And if you're not yet, I'm going to try and convince you <laughs> um, that at least, maybe not GDSM, but, but at least factor graphs are worth your time in, in thinking about it. Um, a lot of that work has been focused on perception. Um, and, but after I came back from, from uh, industry, I really wanted to, I guess, really impact the world by action. So I thought about how can I use factor graphs how can we use factor graphs to, to do action? And some of this work already started even before I, I, uh, I left. But uh, so let's, let's talk about that. So um, some years ago, I, I did help as a, as a, as a chief scientist to, to start Skydio. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, Adam and Abe, uh, the CEO and the CTO respectively, are actually were students of, of Nick Roy. Nick Roy was in my lab, uh, my, my you know, same, uh, fellow grad student at CMU. So they were my academic nephews. But then I, n now I reported to them. So that was an interesting uh, switch, right? Um, and they enlisted the, the help of their friend uh, Matt to become their CXO. Do you know what CXO means? It's a chief experience officer. So, so the idea is, you know, the, the, the customer is central. We need to create a cool experience for, for, uh, uh, for the user of, in this particular case, this drone, which is the first commercial product from Skydio. It's a drone. <clears throat> this is the first instantiation. Um, and it's, it's, it looks like a regular drone with, with a pan tilt uh, camera in front. But uh, the secret weapon here is that it has, uh, this, this drone has 12 navigation cameras arranged in six stereo pairs, OK? Um, and that will enable it to, to function fully autonomously in, in, densely, in dense obstacle en environments. Um, so so that's, um, that's pretty cool. Um, and then later, they, uh, they, after I left the company, they, they built a second version of this drone. And, and uh, Luca was uh, 
has a drone. Uh, this is the Skydio 2. Um, and you see it's quite small, it, it, but it has a larger battery life than the first one. Um, and it doesn't have 12 cameras, but it has uh, three very um, wide field of view cameras here on the top. So they form a trinocular stereo rig that give you vision on the entire top hemisphere. And then they have the same at the bottom. Uh, so that it's not exactly the same, so, so the cameras actually sit on the other arm, right? So you need to actually stream um, high resolution video. All of these cameras are 4K uh, grayscale, have to be streamed to sort of an NVIDIA, uh, I think this is a TX2 or a TK2 that's in there. Um, and, and actually doing that is, is, is complex. One of the biggest problems we had, even with the first prototype, is is these, uh, these high bandwidth uh, transmission cables from the cameras to the processors in the, in the process of fabrication, they got pinched and then, so there's, hardware is really hard. If, you, if you're thinking of a startup, software startups are so much easier than hardware startups, okay? Um, luckily, I was on the, on the software side of this company, so I didn't have to deal with most of it, but this, this then has a, a pan tilt, uh, on the front, which is a 4K, 60 frames per second color camera. Okay, so so it's it's really an awesome piece of technology. Part of it is the hardware that makes it great. It's small, it's omnidirectional, but but part of what it makes it great is the software that's running on it. And the software is basically what we all do, which is which is slam and 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 inference and and estimation. Um, so so let me talk a little bit about that. Um, there is a, a cool um, marketing video that they made from for the Skydio 2. Um, most of the, of the footage that you see, so this is the internal representation, most of the footage you will see is actually f shot by the, the drone itself. Okay? And the, the, the use case here is, is following people as they do cool stuff. Um, I know you're all grad students in Cole, Boston, but in California, you mountain bike down the, you know, the mountains and go windsurfing. And uh, last week, I was in, uh, in, in California. I, I went to uh, LA, where my son does a PhD, and, and, and to San Diego. It was 80 degrees. We were on the beach. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, so what, what do you do? How do you make this, this thing fly autonomously? The, the, uh, the, the pipeline is actually quite classical to so extract features. Uh, these features you can track through frames. And because you're tracking them in 12 cameras or, or six, um, which have a 360 field of view, that turns out to be quite important. It's actually hard to do slam with a, a single forward looking camera. Okay, there is a lot of ambiguities. You can't you know, disambiguate translation from rotation easily. But with 360 field of view, it becomes much, much more um, well-defined. So, and then you can build uh, a, a sparse slam solution. And this is what I helped them build. Um, we went from single camera to multi-camera. Um, a sparse real-time slam solution that provides this ironclad geometry on which you can then do dense stereo, and dense stereo gives you obstacle avoidance and all the nice things, right? Um, and factor graphs and GTSAM are, are, were central and are central in, in solving this. So it solves the slam, but it actually also solves uh, the action. So how do you plan uh, the trajectory? Um, so so at, at, at Skydio, we, I was also involved in sort of the motion planning, and there we use factor graphs for, for motion planning. Um, so, so none of this was sort of possible without, uh, the reason why they called me is, hey, you know, we saw that you use GTSAM, or that you create the GTSAM with, with your students. Do you want to be an advisor to the company or join? <laughs> and then I, I joined for, for a while. Um, and that was, that was really, uh, really an amazing time. Um, so, so let me tell you a little bit about, um, about factor graphs and why you would want to think about them. Um, I will then sort of recap some successes, uh, many of them by, by Michael and, and Luca, um, on using factor graphs for perception and estimation. Um, 
But then the rest of the talk I will spend on factor graphs for action. How, do, how can we use the same representation to plan and act in the world? Okay. Um, all right, so factor graphs model both perception and action problems in a, in a very nice uh, way. So, so here are a couple of examples. Um, interestingly, the, the laser pointer doesn't actually do anything on the screen, it seems. Uh, maybe it does on that one. No, there you go. So, so in the in the top right, um, I can move my mouse here. So you'll see that you have a, a tracking problem. So here, the tracking problem could be you're tracking a person from the uh, from the camera. Um, these are not abstract things. I'm talking about real things now. Okay. So you have a a camera. The camera, by definition, is pointed at your customer. Um, and you want to try and track that person over time from, from observations, okay? So, so what you want to know is the unknown variable is, is uh, what is the location of the person at time one, at time two, at time three. You also have a motion model of the person. So there is a factor which, which is a probabilistic relationship between, between x1 and x2. It says if I was at time one, that was, I was here, then at time two, I'm probably close. Okay, so that's a probability distribution on the joint space of x1 and x2. Um, you also maybe have a prior as to where the person started out. Okay, maybe the person started out at the origin and then you, you track the person. And then you have these unary factors that encodes the relationship between the measurement, which is, which is given, so there's no unknown variable for the measurement, because it's not unknown, it's known. So you have a, just a factor that is a probability distribution on x1 derived from the measurement, which could be, could be anything, right? And in, in, in the Skydio case, it was, you know, detect the person, relocalize it, and then you have a 2D observation in the image, and you try to uh, track the person in 3D. So in this case, the variables here are three-dimensional, the measurements are two-dimensional, and you have a motion model, say, constant velocity or, or something. Um, but people are arbitrary and, 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 and difficult, and, and so, you know, they have their own mind, uh, you know. So can we, can we actually estimate what's in their minds? Okay, so now, do, now we're going into hybrid inference. Okay, so we can add a, a sequence of discrete variables at the top with, with its own Markov chain. This is now a discrete Markov chain um, that influences what the person does. So maybe the person is, okay, I'm running along, so the, the discrete state is, is running along, running along, going straight, but then you take a, you know, you're gonna do a left turn, so that, you know, the person is not thinking about going left, so that's a whole different motion model. So you see that the, the discrete state influences the motion model, and so this is estimation in a switching system, right? Um, you can also do, optimal control with factor graphs. And so this is uh, the second half of the parts uh, of, of the talk. So, so um, now the, the, the states are, what is your trajectory that you want to effectuate in the future? Uh, and how do you effectuate, uh, how do you create a trajectory? Well, you do it by a sequence of controls and the controls tell you what the, you know, it al allow you to influence the, uh, the dynamical system between successive states in time. And so the optimal control problem is find the trajectory and the controls together. Uh, that's, that's called collocated optimal control in a way, right? So um, to satisfy an objective, and how do you specify objectives? Well, you specify objectives by adding factors that are now costs that you want to, costs that you want to minimize or rewards that you want to maximize. And then there is some more complicated graphs here, but you know th these are SLAM, pose graphs for SLAM, uh, SLAM with, with, uh, with landmarks and, and a structure for motion, which is a computer vision SLAM um, right, uh, version. Um, so I'll talk about them in a little bit more detail. Uh, so many of these are just optimization problems. You, uh, you, typically you find one solution, which is uh, the maximum probable solution, or one of the modes of your probability distribution. And you could get in the wrong mode, uh, but, but, and, and that's exactly the sort of the, the cutting edge of, of research where, 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 where John and his students are doing a lot of thinking about multimodal problems, and, and, and Michael at CMU is, is doing that as well. Um, but you build this factor graph 
you can build it on the fly uh, as your robot is moving uh, and it, it finds landmarks and, and you add factors for measurements, uh, variables for landmarks, and then you have loop closures, etc. cetera. Uh, this, this is a slide by Michael. Um, and so I'm going to argue, uh, maybe, um, I'll, I'll try to give you evidence but, but part of the evidence is just my experience. I, I've experienced at, at the Georgia Tech and all these companies um, that factor graphs are just an amazing thing to write on blackboards or whiteboards, okay? It ties together all these problems. It, it allows you to sketch out, okay, this is our problem. These are the constraints. These are the, the things that are connected to this. This gives you the structure of the problem. And so it allows you to talk about uh, it, it ties together different engineering teams, you know, so the, the action team and the perception team, and so it gives you a, a common language to talk about all these things. Um, so just aside from, even from, aside from performance, factor graphs are worth your time. Um, all right, and so I'll give some examples for, for perception. And by the way, I can make this quite interactive, so if you have any questions, uh, there is a question there. Just a general graphical model from statistics and a factor graph, is it? Uh, no, a factor graph is a form of a graphical model. So the, the most commonly known graphical models um, are base nets, uh, which can be trivially converted into factor graphs. So, so, um, and typically you always want to do, in fact, Kevin Murphy, who wrote the book on, you know, probabilistic estimation and HMMs and all these things, he has a base nets inference library, and the first thing he does under the hood is convert it to a factor graph, then do inference, right? Um, the other well-known graphical model is, is, um, is, is, is Markov networks, right? Um, where you have not, you don't have, um, you just have undirected edges that sort of encode the Markov blankets. Uh, but I will argue with that anytime you have a Markov network, it's better to, to talk about the factor graph which can bring finer structure out. So it's one of the array of graphical models from statistics you can use. That's a great question. Would you say the key benefit is making explicit conditional independence relationships to exploit the sort of problem structure, things like sparsity, and in terms of factor graphs versus more general graphical models? Yeah, absolutely. Let, let me give you an example here. So the example is the one that I've been showing since RSS 2005 at MIT, okay? Um, which I think was the first RSS. Yeah. Um, and and um, back then my, my daughter was like five and now she's 22. <laughs> so um, the, this is a little robot and, and it's, it, it goes around and it, it, it samples the environment. In, in this case, it, it, it takes bearing range measurements to trees. Uh, this is actually a truck driving in a park in, in Sydney. Um, and this is then the factor graph. Um, and it shows very well um, that, that, you know, this, this landmark here is only connected to a subset of the, of the truck positions. So it was only visible for a small amount of time. And so that induces sparsity. This, this thing is not seen from the very first position. So the sparsity here is encoded in that bipartite graph, okay? It's bipartite because these little factors tell you the, the nature of the probabilistic constraint between them. Right, um, and in fact, this sparsity, uh, and, and, and I said this in a, in a meeting with, with Leslie today, so, so there is a deep connection between factor graphs and, and, uh, and sparse linear algebra. Um, this graph is literally the, conne the, the connectivity graph of this square matrix, of this non-square matrix, right? So for rectangular matrices, uh, for, for symmetrical matrices, you can think about the sparsity as an undirected graph. But for rectangular matrices, you have rows and you have columns. Well, the columns here are actually just the variables in this factor graph, and the rows are the factors. So you can see that, you know, for example, if you take the, uh, the, the row of this sparse matrix aligned with uh, the, the bar in A, it has some connection to some poles and it has some connection to some landmarks, right? But, but looking at this graph tells me a lot. Looking at this matrix tells me nothing, right? So, so the factor graph is really the embodiment of the sparsity of, of this linear algebra problem here. 
Why is it a linear algebra problem? Well, um, because the, if you solve large scale least squares problems, which is basically what you do in SLAM or structure for motion or tracking, um, in the inner loop, you know, you, you might have an outer nonlinear loop which linearizes and then creates a linear problem, and then you solve that linear problem um, by, by creating this sparse matrix if you want to do that. We don't do that in GTCM, we just have the graph. Um, and then we do bucket elimination, Leslie, which is also known in linear algebra as QR factorization. And then you get a factorized matrix, which is basically the solution to the linear system. You now have a new estimate, and then you linearize again. Okay? So, so that's interesting because, but who knows here, when I talk about bucket elimination, what I'm talking about? Raise your hand if you've ever heard the term bucket elimination. Okay. So only four or five people. So I, I hear that Rena Dechter visited here, right? So, so she, she is a professor in UC Irvine. She's very well known for constraint satisfaction. She's like the queen of constraint satisfaction uh, at solvers. And she literally wrote the book on it. Um, but before that, she worked with Judea Pearl on inference in base nets, and so graphical models. If, if you say graphical models in machine learning, where did they come from? They come from Rena Dechter and Judea Pearl. Okay? And how you do inference in these uh, base networks is you can do that with bucket elimination. Back then, um, it's probably not as apparent to Rena that, that bucket elimination is QR factorization in linear algebra. But, um, so these things are all deeply connected. Yeah. Um, in fact, that's, that's, that's the key advantage from the performance side. So there's a, there's a human anthropological advantage of just talking about factorizing on the, on the blackboard, but there is also a raw performance benefit, which is that if you expose that sparsity, then you can use all the tricks from linear algebra. And, and, and people that do linear algebra have come up with a lot of tricks, okay? Heuristics on how to order the, the, the bucket elimination. How do, you, how do you eliminate variables in what order, okay? How do you split up graphs, you know, recursively? That, that is the famous uh, finite element, um, you know, separator theorem, et cetera. Is, is bucket elimination related to marginalization or? Uh, if you eliminate a variable, you have effectively marginalize it out. That's right, that's right. But um, what, what happens is you, you, write, you, you marginalize it out, but you also keep around a function that it, once, once you solve the problem, in fact, uh, I, I probably don't have a slide on that because this is not, not that talk, but um, you keep a function that if you then solve the entire problem, you can recompute what the, f the optimal solution is for that variable. We'll see some examples later. Um, anyway, so there is, raw speed opportunities as well because of this connection with linear algebra. Uh, and then and we did a lot of that in, 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 in my group. Um, so, so, so this is Alex, he, who works at TRI now. Um, he was thinking about, okay, if we fly multiple drones, say we build this massive factor graph, but could we cut it up in little pieces and solve pieces on the drones themselves and then just send some information back and forth to still solve the exact same problem. Okay, um, so that was an ICRA 13 paper. Um, with Michael, some of the most influential work we did is, is, is think about, well, in linear algebra, the only thing you get from QR factorization is this ugly looking upper triangular matrix, which doesn't mean anything to anybody, all right? Um, but it turns out that the structure, there is a deep structure in this matrix which is another graphical model from statistics and machine learning, uh, which is the junction tree. So it, it turns out after you do inference on this factor graph, you get a triangulated base net, with a, which is exactly that R matrix. And not only is it a base net that is triangulated, but it has, if you, if you look at the cliques of that base net, you get a, a tree structure which, is, which we call the base tree because we, we think of it as directed, but the undirected equivalent is basically the junction tree from machine learning. So again, a deep connection between all these concepts from graph theory, statistics, machine learning, and, 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 um, and linear algebra. Um, 
and, and, and people do know this in linear algebra, that there is a, they call it the clique tree, okay? Uh, and, it, and it's used to, to create sort of large parallel solvers, you know, for multi-processor clusters. Um, and with this base tree, um, we, we can enable, uh, and this is, this is, um, this is an old uh, movie. Uh, this is when, when, when Michael was a postdoc here uh, that we did this work. So, so John is, 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 uh, is a co-author on this paper. Uh, and that's, that's uh, our incremental SAM paper, um, where you will see that the base tree um, is, is created. So every, every uh, green, uh, uh, so we're, it's a robot exploring a, a Manhattan world. And then if you do inference on this SLAM problem, you, you get an upper triangular matrix, but nobody cares about that one. But the tree itself is laid out from the, from the present to the past. And because we lay it out that way, almost, the tree is almost constant. Only the very top of the tree changes. And that is a, the key insight in making incrementals mapping um, very fast. Because except if you have a, a loop closure, uh, the, 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 the computation is almost constant, basically. Right. And if you have a loop closure, it depends on the size of the loop closure, how many variables are involved as to what what size of the base tree you have to uh, recompute, right? Uh, and, and by the way, again, making connection with Rena Dexter, I guess I'm talking more about Rena Dexter here than about, but, but she, you know, she's a hero of mine. She's, she's really, really, you know, great. And she taught about all these computational aspects already. So she, she has um, uh, mini buckets, which is really a heuristic inside a, a, a clique tree. Um, you know, to, to limit sort of the size of the cliques that you look at, at or, you know, so, um, so a lot of this work is also sort of present in, in, in papers in classical AI and, and constraint satisfaction. Um, with Luca and, and, uh, and Christian Forster, so Christian is a, is a student that, that joined us for one semester only in, in, in uh, right? Um, and he's uh, fr from David Escaramuzza's group in, in, uh, back then at, at uh, University of Zurich. Uh, David is now at ETH. Um, we took his really cool uh, visual odometry pipeline and put it together with ISAM and, and the uh, uh, IMU factor. So, so this, this little gadget, many of you will be familiar with, uh, it's an uh, inertial measurement unit. It com comprises of a... Um, a gyroscope and an accelerometer, and it's a really annoying sensor. Okay, it's really great if you just want to know I mean, what is my how is my phone oriented, which is exactly what the gyros the accelerometer does in in your phone. The only thing that Apple uses the, the accelerometer for is points to gravity. Okay, um, but what more nefarious uses of accelerometers can put. Uh, an ICBM, you know, and launch it uh, in, in, in the US and have it hit a target in Russia with 50 meters accuracy without any GPS correction. Okay, so that, that is what you could do if you had an amazingly good and very expensive IMU, okay? Unfortunately, that's not the IMU that's in these uh, phones or in the drone. Um, so dealing with sort of the noise is, uh, is, is, is very, uh, very hard. But we have a, a, a special factor in GDSAM that deals with this, so you don't have to solve it. And, and a lot of this is, is, uh, is actually Luca's work. Um, most recently, we also started looking at, uh, so with, with new students, uh, so this is a new student, Yatong Zhang, who looked at multi-robot SLAM. So we expanded the notion of a base tree to one with multiple, um, uh, multiple uh, routes, so that's work done with Facebook Reality Labs. Um, and then finally, I also want to say, in response to a, a discussion I, was, I had with Ross, um, these slides were made before this. <laughs> so, but, but uh, uh, you know, you could get frustrated with this, with this notion of, hey, do we really have to discretize time finally and then think about the state of the robot at every one of these times? Um, so, 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 so one way is to think about time asynchronously, which, which people do in simulation. So there's this guy, Ethan Grinspan at NYU or Columbia. I, I don't, he thinks about simulation 
uh, in a very cool way. But you can also do something else, which is have continuous time parameterizations for trajectories. So for example, um, B splines or wavelets or, or polynomials. And my favorite polynomial, I already talked about at MIT at one point, uh, is the Chebyshev polynomial. Um, in fact, I also consulted this for a, a company in China, an autonomous driving company, um, started by one of my uh, former students, uh, Ni Kai. Um, and um, every person in the company had a nickname, uh, which was a, uh, a mathematician. Okay? Now, they couldn't pronounce these names very, so it was really funny to visit them and, 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 and try to parse what mathematician they actually referred to. Um, but my nickname was uh, Chebyshev, you know, so. Um, and Chebyshev is a, a polynomial basis, which is really cool. Um, you all know a Fourier series on, on a circle, so you can basically approximate any function on a, on, a, on a circle infinitely closely by adding more cosines and sines. But in robotics, we typically have trajectories with a defined start and a defined endpoint. So, so it's not periodic. So how do we have a, what is a basis, the best basis for, you know, trajectories? Um, well, it turns out you can just take all the cosines of the Fourier series and collapse them onto the midline of the circle. And, and magically, it's crazy, but magically, these things are a set of polynomials. So you, you, you project a cosine of, uh, you know, of period one, one period, right, onto the midline, and you get a, a linear a line. And you, you, you double the frequency, and you get a quadratic. You triple the frequency, you get a cubic, et cetera. So the, and those are the Chebyshev polynomials. So in GTSAM, we, we, we've implemented those. Um, and uh, you, you can parameterize them in, in two different ways, spectral or pseudo-spectral. Um, but we use them then to do state estimation on, on drones. This is with Varun Agrawal, um, where you can parameterize everything in, with Chebyshev polynomials over, over your entire experiment. Like, not only the state, OK? And we, can, we do this in tangent space of SE3. That means you know, we, 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 we have a polynomial in the tangent space, um, so we can deal with, 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 uh, with Lie groups like, like uh, SE3. But also the, the trajectories of these, these are the four trajectories of the motors. So we can, we can after the fact, try to estimate what the motors did. Okay, so that, and that's interesting. Now we're bringing force and, and, and you know. So that, that's, um, all of this is built into GDSAM. Uh, GDSAM is a C++ library that we've been working on for more than 10 years. Um, it, interestingly, it started out as a library in ML, raise your hand if you know what ML is. <laughs> it's always the same two people in the back that are raising their hands. So it's like camel, yeah, or you know, machine. So camel is a is a is an instantiation of M, the language ML, which is a functional language. And the first seven years of my of my professorship at, at Georgia Tech, I did everything in ML, uh, to the frustration of my students. So at one point we, we, we switched because I couldn't hire a student. Um, but ML is a really cool language. Uh, and so, by the way, Swift and et cetera, it's really cool languages that are never used. I guess you guys like Julia, so I really should get into Julia maybe. Um, or not, John is like, no, I'm not Julia. <laughs> um, but this one is C++ based, but we do have wrappers in MATLAB, in MATLAB and Python. So you can just literally open a Colab, okay, do, you know, bang, pip install GTSAM, and do import GTSAM, and you're up and running. Okay? Um, it has, uh, it's open source, so you can use it to start your startup and, and, and become a unicorn startup um, without even mentioning that you use GTSAM. Um, it does optimization on manifolds and Lie groups, uh, and it has reverse automatic differentiation built in. So, so, so certain you can build computation graphs, and then you don't even have to compute the Jacobians sort of numerically or manually. Um, so, free for you to use, and um, and it uses factor graphs, of course, right, as the main computational substrate. 
And by the way, and this, this, this is a slide I wanted to change. Um, this, um, I gave this talk one week after the DAPRA uh, subterranean challenge. Um, it turns out that the, the simulation league was won by one guy, okay, Hilario from Barcelona, all right, who had a simulation of five quad rotors, and he used GTSAM in at least two different ways. Um, he used ISAM and the GTSAM for post-graph optimization. Um, won the simulation league, and with that also $750,000, okay, one, one guy, right? Which he's, he's, you know, to his credit, he's pumping that 750K in his new startup uh, in Barcelona, but, you know, very cool, right? So, so you can use CSAM as a secret weapon to make lots of money is basically what I'm telling you, okay? All right. Um, so, all right. So I spent most of the time to talk about. So I'll quickly go over things that we did for, for um, trajectory optimization. That's sort of the easiest transition. So with Byron Boots, who is now at UW, um, we, we, we tackled motion planning. So motion planning is, is complex. You have to make lots of discrete decisions and, and sort of go left or go right. Um, but once you, you know where you want to go, it, you, know, you, can, you can think of this as trajectory optimization. Right? So you might have a sampling-based planner that tells you, OK, this is roughly how you should go. And then you solve for the joint angles of your arm over time, um, maybe with Chebyshev polynomials, say, right? Um, but it's relatively easy to then put this trajectory optimization problem as a factor graph. You just add factors for your priors on the trajectory. You want some smoothness. You want a task. Uh, you want task objectives like don't collide with things. You know, so you can use sine distance functions around obstacles. Uh, you can add factors for joint limits, uh, etc. And then you can use all the tricks from SLAM and, and Michael Case's uh, ISAM to do this really fast, right? So that's exactly what, what we did. This is uh, Jing Dong and, and Mustafa Makadam and then Byron. Um, so we, the prior that we used in, in, this, in this set of papers was a Gaussian process prior that, that's a smooth set of, of trajectories. Um, we literally encode it as a factor graph uh, and, and then solve it. Um, and, uh, and then also solve it incrementally. Um, so, uh, and we showed that sort of the traditional sort of uh, trajectory optimization motion planners are CHOMP uh, and TRAJOPT. Uh, and, and just by using all the techniques that we sort of discovered, you know, by reading papers in linear algebra, et cetera, uh, we, we, we built GPMP2, which immediately beat the state of the art by, by a factor of 10. Um, and then this is for a single plan, from a single you know, start to a single goal. Um, but if you, in the middle, sort of ch start changing your, your, uh, your, your minds, we can do incremental uh, planning an, another order of magnitude faster. Right? So if you did most of the work already, and if you change just your goal, then actually it's, 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 it's fast to change your mind. Do you have parsing your constraints in those yeah, this is actually pretty sparse. So this is really like a Markov chain with, with, uh, right, with, with smoothness on the trajectory and, and unary factors that, uh, that, do, uh, that do obstacle avoidance. So this is, this is not necessarily the most difficult uh, motion planning problem. The obstacle avoidance constraints, are they applied at all times, for instance? Or, I mean, of course, there's the, the dynamic sparsity in that sense, but, it, but do you apply the same constraints at all times, or do you, like in your uh, post-graph optim optimization, talk about you see only a landscape from a few time samples? Can you exploit that in the trajectory optimization case, too? Yeah, so the, the factor graph here is actually quite simple, right? So it's, it's really we're just trying to solve for the, 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 the joint angles of time one, time two, time three, time four, time five. And at any one of these times, this unary factor says, I don't want to be inside an obstacle. And so it's sparse because it's really connected to one time step only. Right? Um, but we'll come back to more complex uh, constraints, actually, in, in, in like a couple of slides. Um, I've also gotten interested in using robots for art. Uh, and so one of the first things we did is, is calligraphy. Um, so we, we can, this, this robot, a fetch robot, we did Chebyshev optimization for open loop control. Uh, so any Unicode character, you can, you can give the fetch and it will try to paint it. 
uh, by solving uh, an optimization problem with GTSAM, Chebyshev polynomial for each stroke with a differentiable um, image formation model inside. It's still quite, it's still open loop. Uh, so, so my Taiwanese friend said that this calligraphy is at the level of an eight-year-old. Um, but but we're, we're, we're making progress. Uh, we bought a panda robot, so things are going to go smooth now because we can sort of, you know, bolt it to the table, uh, whereas the fetch is on little rubber reels and, uh, and we get sort of crazy uh, things that way. Um, my student Mandy also, um, and so Alberto, you're teaching, where is Alberto? There you go. So you're teaching dynamics. Um, I, I, I've taught a mobile manipulation class three times now, and every time I got to the, 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 the coolest book in that space of robotics, I think, is the Lynch and Park uh, Modern Robotics book. It's a really cool book, very group theoretic, very nice. Um, but when they get to dynamics, things start, start um, becoming complicated, you know, even for grad students. I'm like, there must be a better way to think about dynamics. And, um, and so with, with, with my student Mandy, we thought about, well, just, can we just encode all the dynamics in a factor graph? Right, so, so for a two-degree uh, freedom R, a two-link arm, we'll, we'll just introduce um, uh, poses and twists and twist accelerations and wrenches and torques and just connect them all with constraints. And these constraints encode the entire dynamics of the, of the robot. If you do bucket elimination on this graph, okay, you get this very simple equation that you see in every robotics paper that does dynamics with an M, which is a function of Q, the, the configuration, right? But that's a complicated function, that M. Nobody tells you that, that MQ is really complex, okay? And, and it's very dense. But this is a sparse graph, okay? which encodes in a sparse way that, that, uh, that you know, generalized inertia matrix, right? So you can, yes, you can do bucket elimination, but whether it's wise to do so, that's an open question, right? Um, so that's the recipe. Take Lynch and Park stuff, turn it into a factor graph, uh, optimized with, with GTSAM. Um, so this is an example of, of what Mandy did. So, so she does kinodynamic planning with this. Here is a, a KUKA arm that tries to lift a weight, but the obvious way to lift it is not good because it breaks the torque limits. Uh, so you have to bring it closer to the body and then, and then push it up so you, so you don't exceed your torque limits. Um, and, th and this is done by just laying out a factor graph with all these dynamics constraints and ask, you know, sol solve this for me. So this is now motion planning with, with dynamics. Um, I'm going to skip this, but we also did some jumping robots with, uh, with, uh, with, with uh, soft muscles, uh, but, but I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, because I really want to talk about optimal control, um, and in particular, you, you can actually um, phrase any discrete planning problem or an, a market decision process uh, with, with a factor graph. I mean, people already know that you can do it with a dynamic based net, okay? And, but I told you we can convert trivially any dynamic based net to a factor graph. Uh, so, so here is the factor graph with discrete variables, so discrete actions and discrete states. And the factors here are just, well, this factor says, you know, S0 should be the initial state, okay? There is a factor on S4, which is that better be the goal state. Uh, then there is these uh, unary factors that maybe reward a state, right? So this is MVP. Uh, there is also costs for each action, right? And then the, the most important ones are these uh, ternary factors here that say if you, if you do action three is this, then, then, then S3 and S4 better be in a particular relationship. And that's a constraint. So this is a CSP view on, on discrete planning. Uh, and then you can just go to Rena Dexter's book and, and get one of her solvers and ask the solver to, to solve it. And now you've solved basically discrete planning, but stated as a factor graph, as a constraint satisfaction problem, uh, and you solve it. The, the hidden problem is, of course, that it's, it's, it's exponential complexity, right? So people know that planning is piece space complete, so this doesn't solve that at all. But it's kind of cool 
that the same factor graph that we used for, it's, it's very similar to the motion planning factor graph, right? In fact, optimal control, uh, yeah, you know, so actually I'm gonna skip this, but um, you, can, you can do bucket elimination from the, from the future to the past, and then what you get is, is uh, actually functions that, that encode the optimal policy. Um, this, this would be in an MDP. Um, but you can also go the other direction and eliminate um, from the front, uh, sorry, for, eliminate the front first and then, and then go towards the back and that actually implements like a Dijkstra search in, in discrete planning. Or you can go middle, middle out, which is a Silicon Valley joke. Who knows the Silicon, who, who understands this joke? Okay. But if you don't understand it, you really should watch Silicon Valley. This is like one of the best shows on television. Um, it's a bit older now, but, and I've lived part of that life. Not, not all of it, obviously. Yeah. You can just shove a middle out in the same way? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that, this is really very well known. So you do Dijkstra in one way. So this is forward search and backward search, and you hope to meet in the middle, which is an old idea in classical search. Um, so, so I'm just showing very vaguely that you, these, in factor graphs and bucket elimination, you can, you can have all these same ideas. Um, and then also you can do uh, LQR. So just again, a show of hands. Who knows what LQR is in this audience? Wow, okay, so I'm at MIT. Um, so maybe this is like, you know, in, in one of your first classes or something, you'll get. Uh, so LQR can also be written as a factor graph. So, so, so here we have a, a trajectory over time and we have a control sequence. And we don't want to give too much control, so we put a quadratic on the control, which is a cost, okay? And maybe you have some desirability on some state. Maybe, you know, in, in pure LQR, we will punish everything that's not zero. So we want to get to a state that is zero, right? Um, and so, so you have an initial state, and, and, um, and then it, it turns out when, when you do bucket elimination on this, uh, just eliminate a graph, what you get is a policy this is a, you get a finite horizon LQR policy with time varying matrices here that give you a time varying LQR uh, finite horizon controller. Um, so it, almost exactly the same algorithm as discrete search, okay? Gives you LQR, right? It's just, it's just in fact in GTSAM, not many people know that, but, but you can do SLAM and, and tracking and, and all these things. But there's a, another branch, and I think, um, uh, so Kevin knows this, right? Where is Kevin? Where is Kevin? Kevin is the only other person that works in that branch besides me, right? But there's a whole branch in GDSM that solves Sudokus. Uh, you know, it's just, just bucket elimination and, and, and just constraint satisfaction and, 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 and Boolean satisfiability. And what, with, what I want to do with Kevin is build a, a branch in the middle that does hybrid any hybrid problem you solve, you know, at least try, we'll try to do something. Uh, and then we can give that to, 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 to Leslie and Tomas as, as a general hybrid solver, which will be very expensive, but, but, but uh, yeah, but beautiful in, in principle. No, no pressure, <laughs> so, um, so you can, of course, this is, this is uh, LQR and it's not super problem, super, super, uh, uh, interesting, it's interesting that you can see it as a factor graph solution. Um, but then we can do things like, oh, well, you know, these constraints, these costs are all unary. Could we just have constraints that tie things together over time, Russ? Which, which means now they're no longer local constraints. So you can add constraints um, sort of arbitrarily over time, uh, like periodicity or state-dependent control limits or something like that. So this is work we did with, with Howie Choset and one of his students, um, and, and this is in ICRA. Uh, this is sort of equality constraints LQR with arbitrary equality constraints between time steps. And it's, it's really just build a factor graph, solve it, done. Um, you can also do inequality constraints. So uh, although in GDSM we're not there yet, so we're, we're building uh, in another repo, it's called GT Dynamics, we're building um, an augmented Lagrangian sort of real constraints. Typically we do uh, inequality constraints with soft versions of it, but now we're getting more serious about it. 
Um, and then finally, uh, you, can, you can do this iteratively. Um, so this is an algorithm by, by, by Todorov, I LQR, which is iterative LQR. Um, so now we can, we can optimize for a trajectory non-linearly, then build a time-varying LQR controller around it, and I use that on a robot. And in fact, that's the second art project that I want to share with you, um, which is, um, so, so with, with my student Jerry, we, we want to tackle graffiti with robots. Um, so I'll just, just to deface buildings. It turns out, you know, um, graffiti is a, is a really cool art and, and very prominent in Atlanta. How much time do I have? Am I going too fast? Three, three more minutes, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so Jerry built actually two or three of these cable robots. Uh, turns out we did mocap on graffiti artists and, and you need fairly high accelerations um, and, and, and velocities to do graffiti well, okay? Um, and then we did mocap so we can actually do, um, create new works. So we did mocap here. Um, this is actually my nephew. Um, who visited me, and he's a graffiti artist, and um, mostly he defaces trains and buildings, but now I had him, you know, uh, do mock-up, and uh, he was, he was uh, very impressed, and he did Python scripts, etc. You know, just graduated high school, really. It, it, it was really cool to, to work with him. Um, and now we can sort of take the letters that, that, uh, that my nephew did, and then put them together in different combinations, and have the cable robots execute on the graffiti. Now, how do we do that? Well, we have our desired trajectories. We solve a nonlinear optimization problem using GTSAM to get a trajectory. Then it turns out after you have the solution, you already have the LQR time varying controller right there in the base net. Okay? And then you send that time varying LQR controller to the cable robot. And then, you know, now you have a controlled, um, you know, graffiti system. Um, cool. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll stop. So there is a whole uh, line of work where we try to do estimation and control at the same time, um, which is steep. Um, so, so um, but I'll, I'll, I'll just skip that part because I'm at the end of my time. So, uh, all right, that's it. And this is lots of people that worked on this, so here they all are. I mentioned some of them by name. Who wants to go with the first question? All right. The person in the Christmas sweater. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for coming to talk with us. I guess I'll stand. Um, so at the end of the day, all these problems are non-convex. At least, maybe not all, but a lot of them. Um, which, like in, in SLAM, we find a lot of the times the initialization strategy really matters. For all of these new action type problems that you're solving, do you find that you have to be somewhat artful with the initialization strategies, or in general, it just works out? Um, it really depends on the problem. So, some, even, even some action problems are easy. I mean, LQR, for example, is convex, and, 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 right? It's just solving one linear system. Um, but yeah, no, the, these, the, the, I think that's the big problem. And, and, and especially, well, a lot of you are interested in mixing discrete and continuous things. And then that's the whole TAMP problem, right? And I'm super interested in TAMP and what, what, what you guys have done here for TAMP uh, in at least two different groups, um, where you're mixing task level things and, and, and then continuous motion planning things. And those are very non-convex, very non-linear, exponentially complex. Um, so, so initialization, in a way, is the whole game there. It's like, you know, and you search your way with heuristics and try to find a spot where you will not be deep in the mud in some local minimum. So, uh, yeah, I guess I think initialization is the whole game, and you have to be artful, absolutely. Wants to go next. There's a question here. 
Yeah, this is a really very interesting talk. Uh, thank you so much. I have one general question. Like, what, what would you say is the weakness of Chittism? Like, what would you change about it if you go back? <laughs> <laughs> well, the weakness is it can do Sudokus, well, with appropriate constraint satisfaction propagation, it can do Sudokus. You give it a 9 by 9 Sudoku and it never terminates, okay? So with bucket elimination. But, and it can do optimization really well if you give it a good initialization right, for nonlinear problems. But it cannot do the mixture of both. So I think that's the, uh, the final frontier, if you want, is, uh, is, is if, you have, if you can just do an arbitrary factor graph and you have an algorithm that can solve it. Um, and that is really the TAM problem, if you think about it. Okay, but, but also many other interesting problems like data association and, and semantic slam and any, anything that has sort of value judgments or discrete variables in it. Uh, so it would be great to be able to have solutions that push in that direction. And many of them are, 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 are being developed here and in Michael Case's group at, at CMU. He has some really cool ideas there. So, um, so Kevin has a really cool, uh, right? So. Um, th th I think that's the weakness, and, and that's the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Um, fantastic, Frank. Really awesome. Um, how about the class of problems that involve humans? So, sort of, I would say, human-centered robotics or robots interacting with humans, and, for example, helping elderly people in their houses or helping drivers to drive more safely. Can you imagine the, how the factor graph methodology might embrace um, understanding and predicting human behavior? I'm not an expert in that. So, so um, I, I don't have any experience with that, except that we were tracking people with, with the Skyview drone. Um, there is two, I mean, two things that I hinted at, which is that you can do inference on intent, right? And this is a very old idea in Air Force, People have do, been doing sort of maneuver detection since forever, right? Um, and so, and that's a human pilot that they're trying to do inference on. Uh, so, so that's that's one way. Um, um, but, but I that's I don't have deep ideas about about that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Frank. Great, great presentation. So. Um, a question about how to use GTSM. Let's say I'm doing deep learning, right? I'm not doing traditional geometric estimation. Is there an easy way in which I can take advantage of the library for, uh, for deep learning? And the second question, which is um, somehow related, um, most of it is CPU based right now. Can we take advantage of GPU to speed up some of this? I, I think the answer, I can give the same answer to both questions, so that's good. good. Um, yeah, so, so, um, when I first joined Google, I, I, uh, I worked with the Swiss for TensorFlow team. And I, I already hinted that I like languages, right? I worked in ML and I love Swift. Um, and then Chris Latner, who had invented Swift at Apple, went to Google um, and then started this whole Swift for TensorFlow um, initiative. So I thought, like, this is great. We can do factor graphs and deep learning in the same language, and I get to play with Swift. Um, Unfortunately, now Google, Chris Latner left Google, and then and Google iced uh, Swift for TensorFlow. So, so we did, you know, a project and we submitted a paper. But but uh, so now we're trying to go back to to Python. A lot of deep learning is done in Python. Um, so so, and so we're trying to think about how we can expose. We already have a, a, an arbitrary factor graph factor that you can get, you have a function, you give a lambda function in Python, and you create a factor, and, and a GTSM will, will do optimization for you with that factor. And that, so that lambda can be an entire PyTorch network, right? But unfortunately, if you have a million of those factors, it will call the GPU a million times separately. Whereas really what you should do, and especially if you have a TPU or, a, or, or, or something, right? you, you want to do the, a batch with a tensor that's a million long and immediately send everything, or batch it up in mini batches of, say, 20, you know, on a GPU, uh, you know, 32, on a TPU, 3,200. Okay, so, the, so of, uh, of that. Um, 
So we're, we're thinking about how to enable that uh, right now so that you can use deep learning uh, sort of in a, in a performant way. Yeah. And by the way, I should also mention and, and plug some work by a student from uh, Michael's group. Uh, uh, Paloma Sodi has, has written a really cool paper on, uh, it's called Leo, where she uses energy-based learning to, to, um, to do exactly that, learn factors from lots of data that she then uses in a factor graph framework to, to optimize. Um, so there's a question in the back there. Hi. Thanks, Frank. Uh, I was curious, so as we get to problems with like much larger spatial and temporal scales, uh, and we want to use the factor graph to like encode uh, all the different like observations we've made or the data we've collected, do you think there's like a best tool or approach to take like an arbitrary factor graph and capture like the most important qualities and we get some kind of simpler representation? Or do you think that gets into a very like application specific or open question? No, I, I don't know of any solution there, yeah. When we, I, there, in GDSM we have this uh, graph, um, so nested dissection is a, is, a, is a heuristic that is very good. If you have a graph that is very large but you can split it in two and the split is not too large, Okay, then you can recursively split maybe, and that gives you a very good subdivision, divide and conquer of the problem. And we do that with a library called Metis, which is a graph partitioning library. Um, so that's sort of the most general answer I can give you on how to break up problems into smaller ones. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right, I think that I don't know if there are any more questions. Okay, we'll take one more. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I, I'm, I was just wondering whether, like, how actually the optimal control or LQR was implemented. So, like, uh, in your slide, I saw that you, like, use some unary factors on the control actions and also the states. And I was just wondering, like, is it just simply uh, putting some like zero prior on each of the control actions, or is it some something more complicated? Oh, yeah, than it's that? it's not more complicated than that. In fact, LQR is all linear, so we don't even use the nonlinear factor graph machine. We use a in GTSM it's called the Gaussian factor graph, which where everything is vectors and 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 uh, and every factor is a is a is a Gaussian, right? So or, or quadratic. You know, the, the log of a Gaussian is a, is a quadratic, right? So, um, yeah, just a prior on the, you know, a zero mean prior on the, on the controls and zero mean priors on the states and the constraints are, are just soft factors or, or hard factors if you use augmented Lagrangian. But then, yeah, it's just linear solve. Gotcha, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. In fact, in the linear case, we can even do hard constraints, like, you know, or solver just solves them as part of the, the linear step. So, so linear constraints are, are easy. Yeah. Okay, I'll take the opportunity to ask you one more question. Um, have you done any case where you do both action and estimation, some form of active estimation problem? Yeah, so, okay, show me, I'll show this video. Um, uh, I've, uh, this is this is from uh, a paper called Steep, where we have a robot, and we have a planned trajectory, um, and then as we move, we see that noise on the carpet, etc., sort of deviate from our plan. So then we immediately replan, and we put everything in one factor graph, and then we do fast incremental replanning, um, in, in everything in one factor graph. Now, it's a bit iffy to put both control objectives and estimation objectives in the same factor graph. So, um, so I'm not sure whether we, we would do it like this always. I think we would cut it into two different graphs that grow in different directions. So, um, but it's, it's, it's easy to do incremental control and it's easy to do incremental estimation and, and put them in the, in the same, just flip, 
factors from one branch to the to the from one graph to the other graph, basically. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Again.